Hi guys, it's Phil here. Sorry, I'm slightly late. Uh, our internet has broken as usual every time we try and do a broadcast, but welcome. So today um, we've got a seminar all about how to make change last and how to get your brain working for you. And I've got a list of questions that people have sent in that I'm going to be covering. So if you see me looking down, that's what I'll be doing. Um, so first question, um, I think the one we'll go for is the one about tinnitus and pain. So I was asked a question, and, and, and the answers I'm going to be giving today, although many of the questions people have asked have been about the lightning process, not everybody watching, tuning in is not is going to know about the lightning process. I'm going to keep it slightly more generalised. Um, but one of the questions was, uh, how do you deal with tinnitus? This is from Rob in New Zealand, who's worked in music shops all his life, and so the sound of music he reckons has uh, broken his head, broken his head to a tinnitus. Actually, um, there's no greater uh, chance of getting tinnitus by having loud noise. Actually, you can get it for, for no good reason at all. And the reason I want to talk about it with pain is they work in, in, in a very similar way. So well, first of all, what we need to know a little bit about is about neurology uh, and synapses. So a synapse is basically where we have a, a nerve coming in and there's a little gap between this nerve and the next nerve. And the signal has to jump the gap. And it does that using things called neurotransmitters, which many of us have probably already heard about. And the reason that we have these gaps is a bit like if you have a power station over there somewhere that's producing power to, to power these lights. We want to have the ability to switch the power on and off. The power station will be generating all the time. But we want to have a way of controlling whether we use that energy or that electricity. And the brain's the same. So we have these nerves and these gaps, which allow a signal, if it's coming along, we can choose to stop it so it doesn't carry on. So a good example of this would be, put our trousers on in the morning, or our socks or our shoes, and we feel it initially, and then the feelings disappear as the day goes on, um, because we don't want to be bothered by it. So we have the ability to, to turn down the volume at this synaptic level, so the signal doesn't cross. But the other thing can also happen is that the the um, the volume or the sensitivity of the synapse can be altered so that things show up more. So a good example of this is um, you may have <laughs> been in bed at night, you can't get to sleep, and all of a sudden you hear the sound of a clock ticking, which most of the time you're completely unaware of. But when we are aware of it, it really kind of catches our imagination. It becomes louder and louder and louder. Uh, and this is when we're adjusting this, what we call synaptic threshold. So sounds that normally get blocked and don't go any further now jump the gap and trigger a response in the next bit of the nervous system. And this is the problem with synapses. They're brilliant in that they enable us to, to shut down information like the feeling of our shoes we don't want to focus on. But equally, if they're set wrong, then tiny bits of information keep on getting flooded into our nervous system. And this is fundamentally what tinnitus is. With tinnitus, what's happening is a signal. It may be a signal from the outside, or it may just be blood flowing through your capillaries in your, in, in, in your um, near the auditory canal, or it may be absolutely nothing. Because, of course, we can create signals inside of our brain. We know this. Let's say we have a fear. So I used to have a fear of dentists. I could just be thinking about the dentist and get the sensation of how anxious I was when I was in the dental chair. So you can generate them even internally. But what's happening somewhere along the pathway towards the experience of noise or ticking or vibrational frequency that you get with uh, tinnitus is a signal is being passed along the synapses which shouldn't be done. Okay, so there's an there's a, a, a oversensitivity to things that normally would be blocked is suddenly being allowing these signals to get triggered. And that's quite interesting because that moves it from being something, well, I've just got it, to something that we're doing. Doing with our, our usual do with, a, with a, a you and a circumflex saying, it's something going on in our nervous system, in our bodies, but it is, it is ours. It's not an external thing. It's not... Tinnitus is just a thing. Tinnitus is a process. And once we realise it's a process, it also means we have the opportunity to interrupt that process because, of course, these synapses are things that we, at some level, are in control of, usually unconsciously, of course, although we can learn and train ourselves to control synapses and control sensations. So if you've ever done any mindfulness meditation, your job is to... Yeah, your, 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 your conscious mind is normally running around like a crazy thing and with a mindfulness meditation or anything that brings you into the present the idea is to bring that to stillness and bring that to calmness 
but we can also do it like you know when we're uh, when we're a student and we we have to do homework and there's some great TV or something on on a computer we may drag ourselves back to what we're supposed to be able to do so we can change our relationship to sensations and, and input massively and this is why tinnitus is very similar to pain so we work a lot with chronic pain as well as with tinnitus and they pretty much have the same success rates which are pretty good because if you can teach someone how to interrupt that signal that shouldn't be going down that pathway then it gives them an opportunity to not have the signal and therefore not have the end result. And if the end result is tinnitus, they can switch the tinnitus off. And if the end result is pain, they can switch the pain off. Now, uh, I, I say that uh, very rapidly, but obviously there are times where we do need pain. You know, if you've got something that's uh, significant enough for you to have pain that you need to go and see medical attention, then pain has a, a useful purpose. But what we're talking about here is chronic pain, where actually the problem has been identified or it's not resolvable or it's gone, and yet you still got the pain. Uh, and we see this a lot. We saw that we had a girl uh, in New Zealand, a teenager, who had um, such bad chronic pain, chronic, chronic regional pain syndrome. They tried everything and the doctors decided the only solution left was to cut her leg off, which seems pretty extreme, but they just didn't know what to do. And luckily she came to see one of our practitioners and she was able to resolve this because, you know, cutting a leg off is a pretty <laughs> extreme response they didn't know what else to do but fundamentally what we've got to do is find a way to switch off those pathways and that's a lot about the work that we do is how do you direct your brain in a better direction than the one it happens to be going in at the moment because of course our brain is is so important it's so important in how we think but of course it has a whole another amazing set of functions where it controls how our body works so uh, if you imagine you know, a complicated car engine nowadays has a little computer, a little brain in. Its job is to like check the oil temperature. Is the car too hot? Is it running fast? Does it need water in your in, in the systems? Does it need water in the windscreen wipers? Uh, is it icy? All these kind of stuff is constantly checked checked by the computer system in your car. Well, guess what? Our brain does that, but a million times better because it's much smarter. It's constantly checking what's our blood pressure like, our blood temperature like, what's the concentration of uh, various chemicals, carbon dioxide. Uh, vitamins, fats, sugar levels, all sorts of stuff is constantly being managed by our brain. And if our brain isn't working properly, we can see, you know, you can have a car where the engine is fine, but if the computer system is somehow misreading what's going on in the engine, it can shut down the engine. So the engine now doesn't work purely because of the neurological, in this case electrical, control. Our brain does the same thing. The other thing the brain does, it doesn't just measure things, it changes things, so it produces hormones that switch things on. So like insulin is a hormone that affects our blood sugar level. There's all sorts of hormones in our, in our digestive system that tell us we're hungry, that allow us to digest food, to move food onto another part of the digestive system, it controls our muscles, it controls so much stuff. So it's not just listening, it's also actively intervening. So again, if the brain doesn't work properly or isn't quite functioning perfectly in the way that it needs to, like a Formula One, motor car then things can start to go awry. This brings us on to uh, one of the other questions that people had was um, okay well what happens if I constantly focus on symptoms and illness? Um, if we have symptoms it's quite normal that we're going to focus on them but as if you've seen my previous broadcasts, you'll know about neuroplasticity, the idea the more you run a pathway, again, here's our little nerve coming to join another nerve, but this, in this case, there's two potential nerves. It could go down, it could go down this one, or it could go down an imaginary one here. At the synapse, it has a choice. If it keeps on triggering this neuron, this pathway, then what happens is the pathways actually move together, and the one that's not triggered starts to drift away. So you get changes in the way your brain works. So if you have symptoms, it's natural you'll start to think about them, talk about them, people, your friends will go, how are you feeling? But of course, each time you run down that pathway to say symptoms, the pathway gets stronger, the synapse, synaptic gap gets smaller, and as a result, it's easier for these signals to jump across. So much like tinnitus and pain, it's easier for these signals to be transmitted. And the research is every time we think about a problem, we trigger neurology. So if you think about uh, pain, for instance, if you scan your brain, we'll see a lighting up of your pain processing centers. And this is a bit of a pain because, because literally, if you've got a symptom, you're bound to be thinking about it. It's completely natural. People are bound to be asking about it. 
But in those conversations, you're actually making the problem more deep, more problematic. So the question was, well, a bit you know, concerned about focusing on symptoms. It's normal that you would focus on symptoms, but it's also important to switch that way of thinking off. What's intriguing with our body is that most of the time we, we don't even think about our body. You know, If I was to say to 100 people in the street, you know, hey, how's your body feeling? They'd kind of go, I haven't even thought about it. But if you were to ask them and say, no, no, really, just for a moment, just scan your body and just notice anything that's not good, anything that's not working, they go, oh, uh, oh yeah, now you mention it, yeah, I can notice I have got a bit of a bad hip. Thank, you know, thanks for, for, for mentioning it to me and bringing my attention to it. But up until that point, it didn't show up. It wasn't an issue for them. So when people have got used to the neurology of having symptoms just because they've been ill for a long time and chronic illness, it's very common that they go down that pathway a lot of the time. When they recover, when they sort their stuff out, whatever it is, and get their physiology and their neurophysiology working better, those pathways are still quite powerful. And so, and we talk about this in the lightning process and other work we do, there are bound to be times when you have an illness which is similar to whatever caused your original big illness. And when that happens, it's almost bound to start to trigger those not very helpful pathways for you. And that's where you need to really take stock and think, right, how can I shift out of that way of thinking? And again, much like tinnitus, the volume, the sensitivity has been turned up. So you're hyper aware. So um, people who've had, say, glandular fever, mono or chronic fatigue, often they'll have sore throats and their glands will have been up for a long time. And they will be much, much more aware of this area than anywhere else. Um, so by uh, having that acute sensitivity in that area, they'll notice things that other people wouldn't notice. Now, you might think it's a good thing to be more aware of your body. And to some extent, it is good to be aware of our body. But there's, there's a, 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 a ignoring it, and then there's a being aware of it in a normal level, and then there's being a hypersensitive, hyper-aware of it. And if you're in that level, or completely unaware, then there are problems. So what can we learn from this? Well, tinnitus, pain and illness seem to be very similar. They certainly are neurologically. If we've got into a state of getting very familiar with certain nerve pathways, then they run all the time. And the more they run, the more they, they strengthen and develop, and the more we need to switch those things off. So how do we switch it off? So this, this leads us to another question I'm going to talk about in a minute, which is uh, how to be more calm. Being calm is generally quite a good attribute to develop, and most of us aren't as calm as we need to be. But in terms of this focusing on symptoms, it's, it's very likely that you'll be doing it and you'll do it in a way that most people don't do it because most people don't experience chronic illness. It's a, it's a rare thing. And when it does happen, it, it knocks you sideways. But to recognise that's just something that you've developed, that neurological sensitivity, because that's been your experience in life. And you can change it because, like we said with tinnitus or pain, it's not a thing, it's a pathway that's being triggered. And pathways can be triggered or pathways can be sedated and relaxed. So uh, let's move on to um, calmness. And, and I'm going to connect this with another question that somebody asked, which is, let's say you've got well um, of, of a, an issue or an illness in your past and then you have to go to the doctor and they often want to know how is it, how is it going and they will check in with you and ask you questions about the thing that used to create this neurological sensitivity so how do you deal with it well the best thing to do is actually to prepare in advance and think right how would I like to be what state would I like to be in when this happens, and just very quickly, I talk about states, which I talk about in most of my my broadcasts. States are what state of mind are you in right now? And that could be uh, this is really interesting. It could be oh, I wonder if it's time for food yet, or how long is it going to be until he stops talking? All these are states, and the question we need to ask ourselves is: Is the state we're in the most useful state for the job that we're doing? And the answer, unfortunately, is mostly not. We're mostly not in the best state. So I'd like to just think about this for a minute, which I think is a, is a really good exercise to do. It's kind of a mindful exercise, although it's not from mindfulness, which is if states are either brilliant, you know, the, the best possible state, so when you're doing your homework, you're really focused. When you're relaxing, you're really relaxing. When you're with your friends, you're really sociable. When you're out in nature, you're really present. When you're running a race, you're really you know, on your best. All those are states. If we take 
for the concept, you're either in the best possible state for the thing you're doing, or you're not, and that's all it is. You either are or you're not. So you're in the best possible state, or you're in some other state that isn't the best possible state. Think about the last seven days and ask yourself, what percentage of time have I been in the best possible state in the last seven days? And if you've got uh, access to the computer that you're on, just pop it down in the comments section, just put a percentage. The percentage of time, not, not the percentage of time, I was in an okay state, a mediocre, a fine, an average state, but the best possible state considering what I was doing. All right, so really clarify, you're either in the best possible state or you're not. And that not could be, it was okay, it was dreadful, but it was not the best possible state. And just work out the last seven days, last week, what percentage of the time have you been in the best possible state? Just pop it down in the comments section. Hopefully I'll be able to see some of your answers, which would be excellent. Um, on average, most people's answers are somewhere around 5 and 10%, which is pretty shocking, really. So if it's 5 or 10%, then that means that 5 Five or ten percent of the time we are in a great state and the rest of the time we're not and if we're not in a great state then there are consequences to that first of all we don't function very well but also it means we're accessing exactly the neurology of trouble we keep on building the nervous system that we don't want and there are consequences not only to how we feel but how our body works because our brain influences our physiology of course the worst of all possible situations is when you're in the wrong state and the person you're talking to is also in the wrong state. So classically, we get this in relationships where somebody goes, uh, you've forgotten to take the garbage out again. And the other person goes, oh, I forgotten to take the garbage out. What about you? And then we get those classic arguments that happen <laughs> in so many places. If you take a moment to think about the states, every time you've been in an argument, you'll notice that you were probably in the wrong state. Every time things haven't gone the way you wanted to, unless your response has been really resilient, you've probably been in the wrong state. I'm getting some numbers here. It's fantastic. 90, 85, 60. Um, that's extraordinary. Most people are not that high. Uh, so if you genuinely are in the best possible state, 85% of the time, 60% of the time, you are a winner in life because most people are. And not only will you feel better, but also you'll be retraining your brain that this is normal. So this brings us to this question that people ask me. Go to the doctors, how do I deal with it? We need to change our state, and one of the best states to be in is to be familiar with being calm. Because the more you're familiar with being calm, the easier it is to access it. So if you think about, say, the neurology of being calm, the more you go into that state, the easier it is to trigger it. In the same way, as the more anxious you are, the easier it is to trigger that. So I'm going to finish by talking about how to be calm. And it's a, it's a tool that I think is really useful to use. Um, and I, I, again, I include it in many of these broadcasts because it's so important. And I always get asked this question, what is the quickest way to become calm? The quickest way to become calm, in my experience, easy, simple thing that anyone can do, is to listen to your voice. Classically, if somebody's stressed or anxious or not doing calm, then you'll hear them speaking in a very busy way. So they'll be like, ah, they'll be fast, rapid, frenetic, high-pitched. And that may be what they say out, out in their conversation, but equally they could be silent, could just be on their own, and you can hear their thoughts. If, if, if you could listen in, they can certainly listen in. But the more you pay attention to your thoughts, the faster you notice they are. And fast thoughts are interesting. Fast speech, whether it's internal or external, is interesting because when we speak, as I'm doing now, we speak with our out-breath. We speak with our out-breath, then our voice matches our breathing. If we start to speak fast, our breathing starts to increase in speed. When we speak fast, like I'm doing now, our breathing starts to increase, and you can hear that quality of rapidity but of course there's also a physiological link <laughs> the physiological link is if you breathe fast it will switch on your sympathetic nervous system because those two systems are linked if we need to run <laughs> we need to oxygenate ourselves quickly we're running from danger we're dealing with trouble switches on our sympathetic nervous system which is 
great, except it suppresses our immune system, all sorts of other things, if we have it on for too long. If we switch on our sympathetic nervous system all the time, it causes trouble. And certainly it causes anxiety. So the linkage is, the faster you talk, the more rapid you talk, the more rapid your breathing will be, even if you're not saying it out loud, the more you'll be triggering your sympathetic nervous system, which switches off clever thinking, switches off your immune system, stops you being able to relax, nourish and nurture yourself, and generally puts you on high alert, which, is, which I say is okay, but not for the long term. And therefore, it makes you anxious. And long-term anxiety causes a whole range of problems. Remember the stats. If you're happy and healthy, you're more likely to live an extra 10 years. If you're stressed, you're not going to be happy and healthy because stress doesn't make people happy. You've probably noticed that already. And stress doesn't make people healthy. So, with me, just for a minute, what I'd like you to do is just notice the sound of your voice. And then slow it down by half. So just as I'm doing now, just listen as long as you know it's safe for you to listen if you're not driving. Just listen to my voice and have your voice slow down in exactly the same way. By just doing this very simple thing, you're not even really changing what you're thinking about, although that would help too. Just literally changing the sound and speed of your voice inside or with conversation with others. As you can probably notice as I talk to you now in this calm way, brings a sense of calmness. But if I talk like this, you can suddenly notice how that shifts. Talk about this on, on some of the other broadcasts, the idea of mirror neurons. We have these neurons which are designed to help us socialize with other people and they pick up other people's gestures, speeds, ways of talking. That's why teenagers all speak in the same way if they hang out with each other. I think I'm back again. Mirror neurons I was talking about. Mirror neurons allow us to communicate effectively with people and let them feel like they're part of us. But of course, this is a problem because if somebody's being very stressed around us, it's quite easy for us to get stressed through the mirror neurons too. Equally, we can influence other people by changing our state. And then through mirror neurons, they will become more calm. So practice, really think about how fast is my inner voice? How fast is my conversation? You may also notice the sound and pitch of my voice drop down as well. So if you talk fast, rapid, short, staccato, you'll be encouraging stress in yourself and others. Thanks, guys. <laughs> if you talk slowly, lowering the pitch, calming your voice down, then in turn, you will feel calmer because your breathing will naturally change. The speed at which your brain is kind of running will significantly slow. And everything will just start to feel more and more calm. One of the things I often think about, and I like to leave you this thought, is if you're in a strange country and you saw a little puppy, I've got a puppy just beneath me here, a little puppy in the alleyway kind of tracked, and you went to talk to it, you'd notice two things. First of all, you don't speak its language because you're a foreigner. Secondly, it doesn't even speak human anyway, so it wouldn't listen to your words if you, if you could hear them and understand them. So the only thing you have is the sound of your voice. So how would you talk to a frightened child or a frightened puppy who couldn't speak your language? Well, you would just say whatever you said, but you would ensure that you were communicating with the tonality and speed and rhythm, and you do this naturally. So, as we often say in the work that we do in the lightning process, if you treated your friends like you treat yourself, would you have any? So isn't it time to start to bring more of this calmness and kindness to yourself, knowing that by doing that you will be enhancing your neurology and your physiology and your state, but also you may make a difference to other people too. 
So I hope you found that useful. If you have any comments or questions uh, that you'd like me to answer, I can either answer them on Facebook if I can or in the next seminar that we'll do, which we'll schedule in next week. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, pop that down and please share it with your friends. Thanks for tuning in. Hope you have a fantastic weekend. I'm training NLP the next three days. I might see some of you guys here on this call there. Who knows? Uh, have a great time and take care of yourselves. Bye.